Well, hey there, welcome back for 2024. I hope your year's got off to a great start so far. So this year we're gonna start a, a new series and last year we, I did a whole series on the Apostle Paul. So I spent about eight weeks talking about his life and, and just exploring in, in greater depth his ministry journeys uh, and just particularly looking at, at how his letters came to be formed. So it seems only fair that I do the same thing for Jesus. Um, obviously been the reason for the whole New Testament. So I thought for a new year, let's start brand new with uh, from the really from the very beginnings. Let's look at how the New Testament came into being. And so we're going to spend a few weeks looking at the life of Jesus and and really just the reason why Jesus came, who Jesus was. And so I've titled this whole series Who Was Jesus. Now I haven't titled it Who Is Jesus. Now it doesn't sound like it's that big of a deal of a difference, but there is a, a, a nuance there. And just, let me just explore that for a minute. So if I was to ask the question, who is Jesus? Your answer would probably be different from the next person. Who, who Jesus is to you is probably a little bit different from the Christian next to you in church, let's say. Um, you know, who Jesus is for us is really just a reflection of the sort of Jesus that we need maybe in our lives or, or at a particular time. I, I don't know what the difference might be for you. But Jesus, you know, we as, I guess, traditional Christians believe that Jesus is uh, is, is the living saviour, that he's the eternal God. And so for us, Jesus can be many things to many people at different times. And probably all of those are valid. Probably Jesus is many things to many people. Uh, and so I don't really want to focus in on that. I don't want to look at who Jesus is necessarily for you or for me, but rather I want to focus on who Jesus was. Jesus is was a historical person. Jesus was a person who lived 2,000 years ago, and he, he lived in a particular time and a particular place. And so I want to focus in on that. I, I want to look at who that Jesus actually was and, and who he was to the people that he walked with, who, who he was to the people that he hung around with, and, and particularly who he was to the people who killed him? Uh, who was Jesus? And, and I guess ultimately where this question is leading to is why was Jesus crucified? So where I'll, I guess I want to take as a starting point is that sign that was put over Jesus' head. So if you remember uh, in, the, in the gospel accounts when Jesus was crucified, they put a sign above his head and the sign read in three different languages, the king of the Jews. Uh, this this sort of statement about, and this is a typical Roman thing, when, when they uh, crucified a person, they would put the crime uh, on a sign above their heads. They would make it clear to everybody because crucifixion was a signpost. It was the Romans' way of saying, if you do this thing, this is what's going to happen to you. And so it's a clear, literally like a signpost on the side of a road. This is a, a way of saying to anyone passing by, um, this is what you need to know about this circumstance. And so the sign that was put above Jesus' head was king of the Jews, um, the, 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 the king of the Jewish people. Now, there was a lot of protest. Oh, no, he only said he was the king of the Jews, but everyone agreed that this is what the charge was. This is what um, they were crucifying him for, for whether it be, it be it his claim to be the king of the Jews or whether he actually was the king of the Jews or whatever that thing was. And so I want to focus in on that. I want to look at that accusation against Jesus, that claim against him, and really that expectation around who Jesus was. This is what the people thought he was. This is the expectation that was around him or, or the suspicion that was around him, positively or negatively. Uh, and so what did that mean? What was that, what was that to the people who said that about him or, or who crucified him for that? What was the significance of all of that? And so that's what this series is going to be about, focusing in on that particular event, that particular sign, but how we actually get to that place. What, what is that all about? So we're going to begin the story really by asking the question of who were the Jews? If Jesus is the king of the Jews, then who were the Jewish people? Um, and to really tell this story properly, we have to go right back into the earliest times, right back to the very beginning of the story um, of the formation of the Jewish people. So really to do that, we need to go back right back to the Bronze Age. And so today what we're going to look at is just the formation of the Jewish people. 
who were they? How did they come into being? And and really importantly, what was significant about them? Um, how are they so different to all of the other people groups that they uh, they sort of emerged out of? What was so unique about this Jewish faith that Jesus came to be a representative of? So that's what we're going to look at today. And we're going to so beginning with um, this this original the the foundation story, the foundation myth, uh, uh, really of of who these people were. So to really understand. The, the story of the Jewish people, we have to understand that it's sort of a combination of, of history, narrative, and mythology. There, there's, there, there is mythology within, grounded within the story, and it's sort of a mixture of the two. Now, I don't, I'm not an Old Testament person, so I'm not going to spend all of this time trying to decipher between what is myth and what is history and, and all of these things. What's important to recognize is what the Jewish people believed about themselves in the first century. That's really what they were fighting for. That's really what this whole story centers around is how they understood themselves. And how they understood themselves is grounded in that story, the story beginning back in Genesis. That's how they understood themselves. And so whatever we want to argue over or whatever points we want to sort of, you know, squabble over when it comes to the various aspects of the story, it's kind of irrelevant. And, you know, when you get into the scholarly debates over all of these issues, there's arguments from every side about every possible issue. And so again, I don't want to, it's, it's not really the point as to determine which is which. The point is to sort of get an understanding of, of how the Jewish people understood themselves and, and what was so significant about that story or what was it that Jesus saw himself as representing and and really what it was that the people who crucified him saw themselves as defending um, when it when it came to when it came down to it. So that's what we're going to look at today. Now again the story is a combination of of history and, and mythology but where it begins, the the time where it begins is a time that we we have some understanding about, and that's the that's the time of the Bronze Age. Now, the Bronze Age, um, you may not know a lot about this, but the Bronze Age itself, it's a very it's, it's sort of a unique time within human history. So, the dates of the Bronze Age is somewhere around maybe thirty three hundred BC to about eleven seventy seven, and we can actually date it quite specifically. Eleven seventy seven, we can sort of date a particular year where all of these Bronze Age civilizations around the Mediterranean all sort of collapse. Now, it's it's another story for another day, but um, that's the sort of time period that we're we're dealing with now what was it what was the bronze age well obviously it's characterized by the use of bronze um, bronze was the primary metal that was being used and the reason why you're using bronze is because they haven't discovered how to make fires hot enough to melt down iron now they had iron they, they, they sort of knew about it but they had no way of refining it because they just couldn't get furnaces hot enough and so the best that they could work with is uh, is bronze now bronze itself it's made up of two simple components which is copper and tin about 12 percent tin now that tin is the key thing tin is a lot of tin is actually found in britain and so what that kind of created was a, a sort of a, a global demand for a particular commodity. And so around the Mediterranean, what you start to get are trading networks, trade, sort of a global trade system that's happening around the Mediterranean basin and, and it, with demand for this tin. And so what you do for that is you exchange your own local goods for tin. And so you can make bronze and so you can have bronze for your whatever your the many things that you're using bronze for weapons farming equipment um, bowls cutlery jewelry all these sorts of things so that's we, we sort of get the first global network um, and what what happens in this time is you start to get the rise of of city states you get the rise of of really sort of larger organized um, states and, and governments, and, and really within that, large kingdoms, large monarchies. And, that, and that's really what's an essential point through this story is that this is the emergence of these larger monarchies. Now, to give it some 
sort of historical perspective, we're, we're talking about the time of Genesis. So when you start to find Abraham, who, who we're going to come to in a moment, um, it's this is the time that we're dealing with here. This sort of this period ends around about the time of the the Jewish people coming out of Egypt. So these very very early times in Genesis is the Bronze Age, and so it's characterized by um, again the use of bronze, but also the sort of the rise of these great monarchies. Um, you think about the the Mycenaeans, for example. You think about the Egyptian kingdoms um, that we you know we we hear about the pharaohs and the, and the the pyramids and all this kind of stuff. That's the time that we're talking about when we talk about the Bronze Age. So then with this increase in trade and with this increase in, in larger organized city-states and governments, you're going to get an increase in technology. Um, you're going to get an increase in particularly with organized warfare. So, you know, you're not going, it's no longer um, two villages having a little skirmish with each other. You're talking about larger um, military expeditions, larger city-states going to war with the other city-states. And so you think about the Battle of Troy, um, you know, these two great armies fighting with each other um, up in up in Troy. Those are the sorts of things that we're, we're dealing with here. So, you know, what we've always done, but just on a larger scale. So we've got larger armies, but it's also a time of the development of writing. Now, writing is only being developed primarily to keep accounts. Um, you know, we're talking about large um, trading large exchange of goods and so you need to keep records these larger city states have uh, more um, goods and they're, they're worth they're very valuable um, societies and so you've got bookkeepers and so in order to keep books you need to have a record and so they're writing down these records of of all of this and so it's the emergence of all of these things of writing of of, of, of organized government organized warfare but especially organized religion and so you're getting these larger, the, the beginnings or, or sort of the uh, the formations of these larger organized religions, you know, cults that are forming throughout the Mediterranean, temples that have been built all over the place. So this world is really, the, the world that we might recognize of Jesus' time is really starting to take shape during that Bronze Age. It's, it's a very sort of pivotal time really in human history and, and really the collapse of the Bronze Age is, is, is a really remarkable thing that this whole world sort of collapses into a Dark Age and then sort of re-emerges much later on. Um, we sort of, we come into sort of the Assyrians and the Persians that we're gonna see next week. But all of that sort of had its origins within this Bronze Age period. And so then it's in this time and sort of within this context that we meet Abraham. Now, of course, we meet Abraham early on in Genesis, and Abraham is the pivotal figure for the Jewish people. I mean, everything about the Jewish people stems back to this man. Now, whatever we know about him, you know, scholars are going to be arguing about this from from here until kingdom come. Um, but what is... If essentially, or, or what's presented about Abraham, and certainly what fits with what we understand about that period, is that Abraham is a, a pastoral nomad. Now, basically, what that means is that he's a nomad. He doesn't have a home. He doesn't have a, a, a place that he's. You know, that's my city. I'm I'm Abraham that lives in this particular place. He's a nomad. What he's got uh, is his cattle, sheep, goats, all of these things that, that he sort of he takes them around to where the food is. Um, if you think about where sort of the story of Genesis begins, it happens in an area that we call the Fertile Crescent. This is really where civilization, um, certainly within um, sort of the modern civilization as we understand it today, this is where civilization really emerges. The, the, the Fertile Crescent is, is really the, the cradle of civilization as it's known. And the area in which it takes place is a place that we call Mesopotamia. And Mesopotamia is the Greek word that just means between two rivers. So between the Euphrates River and the Tigris River, you've got this very, very fertile area which just naturally produces uh, all of the grains and grasses that come to be the staple diet of of the human species. So think about bread today. I mean, all of that sort of starts within this, um, this fertile crescent. And so this is why larger cities are starting to form in this area because there's such an there's such an abundant supply of food you don't have to be a hunter gatherer anymore you know you don't have to go out hunting for animals to feed your tribe or feed your 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 clan um you can just stay where you are and the food comes to you it literally just grows out of the ground 
wherever you are. And so this is an area that is is already rich in food. And so it's very understandable then that you're going to have um, graze, grazers, you're going to have pastoral nomads like Abraham who are just going to take their animals to wherever the food is. You know, the animals are going to eat out an area. It's going to be a while before there's food there again, but they need to eat the next day. And so you've got to keep taking them to wherever the food is. And so that's who Abraham is. Abraham's a guy who doesn't have a home. Abraham's a guy who sort of will go from city to city and, and have a lot of engagement with the different cities and villages uh, around that whole area, but there's nowhere that he, he himself actually settles down. And so what we know is that Abraham lives in a tent um, and he with, with all his family. Now, what Abraham is, is that he's not really a king. He's just sort of the the head of his family clan. Now, whoever, however big that family clan was and all of its sort of attendant people and slaves and all of the people that are attached to that clan, he's the head of that. He's kind of the patriarch of, all of those people that are attached to him and all of those dependents on him. So he's something like the CEO of a large company and they are dependent on him for their survival um, and, and for their um, for their well-being. And so that's kind of the role that he takes and, and that's sort of how we find him, where we, we pick him up in the story. Um, he's typical of his people and of his time. He, he worships the various gods of the region. Um, we're going to look more at a moment about the different gods, but gods are much more localized. Gods are uh, gods are sort of found in different places. So you go to a new land, and they're going to have their own gods that are local to that particular geography. And so he's going to worship all of the gods of the region. If he's taking his animals into a particular field that has a particular god for that region, that's the god that he's going to worship. And so he's a pagan. He's uh, you know, as we might say, he's um, he's a polytheist. He worships many, many gods, depending on who the gods are and of a particular place or, or wherever he might find himself. But then, as we know from the story, um, God taps him on the shoulder and he says, hey, um, I've got a plan for you. Uh, you and your family, I want to do something different with you. And so this is what makes Abraham so unique. And really, the God of Abraham so unique is that this God reaches out and says to Abraham, I'm choosing you to do something special with. Um, I'm picking you out of all of the people that are on the earth at the moment I, that I could have chosen. I'm choosing you. You're the guy who's going to be fulfilling this this great plan of mine. You, you are going to be, you and your people are going to be my people. Now, this is just so radically unique because God's don't care about people. They don't interact with people. They don't, the, the local God of a region just does their own thing. And our job is to not step on their toes. And if we do, we offer a sacrifice to say sorry. Um, but apart from that, those gods don't care about us. But so for a God to reach out and say, hey, I, I'm selecting you for this particular purpose is incredibly unique. It's, inc it's, it's unprecedented as far as we can tell. Uh, and so this is what makes Abraham so unique, that God selected him and then pr made this promise to his descendants, to his people, that they would become this this nation. They would become this great people um, of uh, th this people of this this Yahweh, this God who has just introduced himself to, to Abraham. And so Abraham then in response says, okay, sign me up. Uh, I will leave behind all of these gods and I will follow you. You will be the one God, the only unique God that I will follow. Uh, and so this becomes what is so special or unique about Abraham is his faithfulness. It's his the faith, not just number one, to step out and say, hey, um, I'm going to trust this God who I've never heard of before and I'm going to make him exclusively my God. That in and of itself is a great is a great act of faith because to forfeit all of the other gods or to uh, dismiss all of these other gods as being nothing can have detrimental effects if those gods turn around and say, hey, we don't like being neglected this way. Uh, and so that's a big step on his part. But what God's more importantly calling him to is, is the faithfulness. He's is, is, is entering into a covenant relationship with him and saying, look, if you are faithful to this relationship in return, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to turn your children into a nation and you are going to change the world effectively, you're going to become the, the father of a, of, the, of a great nation. Uh, and so for you, in, but in order for me to do that, in order for that to happen, you need to stay faithful to me. You need to be true to me throughout 
the rest of your life and so do your children and their children have to also remain faithful to me so th- so that's the contract that's that's what this covenant is about this 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 sort of exchange um, of of contract it comes down to being faithful to the, this God is always going to be faithful to him but the question is are you going to be faithful back to me so in order to then seal that late at a, at a point later on in Abraham's life God gives him the sign of circumcision um, your people are going to be set apart for me you you're, these are going to be my people and as a physical marker as a reminder to you of this agreement I'm going to give you the sign of circumcision and so Abraham eventually Abraham and all of his the males within the family clan, however many there were, were all circumcised. That first generation really had it tough because they've got to do that as adults. But from then on, all of the boys that are going to be born are going to be circumcised in the same way. And so, again, this is another unique thing. The, the, this idea of being circumcised, uh, as we find out later on, particularly for in the Greek world of, of Paul's and Jesus' time, circumcision is is abhorrent right it's just it's a disgusting thing for these other cultures to even conceive of and so this as a, this is a very unique sign then for um for the for, for abraham and for his descendants to be marked with is that everyone not only do, are they constantly reminded of their place or of this relationship this this thing that they're to be faithful to but everybody else also knows who they belong to um, you're one of those jewish people because it's very easy to tell because it's very easy to tell. It's quite obvious that you are uh, of that group. So then the story continues down through the generations. Again, we don't need to um, retell the whole story, but Abraham has um, Abraham has the son um, Isaac, and then Isaac has the son Jacob, and then Jacob uh, and his wives have give birth to what becomes the twelve tribes of Israel. So the twelve sons of of Jacob, Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel, uh, and then the twelve sons who are then the sons of Israel, and so they become then the patriarchs. They become the foundation of what is going to become the nation of Israel. And so the generations have sort of gone on, and as we know from the story, eventually uh, they end up in Egypt, and in going down into Egypt, eventually they end up in slavery. And so we know from the story then that they spent maybe 400 years down there in slavery, and then after that 400 years, they're liberated. They're set free from that slavery um, from, from Egypt, and they're brought up into the Promised Land. Now, the details of this story um, we find in Genesis, and there's a lot of scholarly speculation about um, the the facts of this story. Um, One of the challenges to the story itself is that we actually don't have any evidence from any Egyptian sources that they ever had Jewish slaves. There's there's just simply no sources for that. And so you sort of get to competing ideas or two competing views about what happened or or how this story sort of really came about. Now, the traditional view is that the the people of God or the the Jewish people indeed were in slavery in Egypt and they were set free around about sort of the middle of the 13th century. So maybe let's say about 1250 BC. Now, that coincides with the... um, with the the reign of of Ramses the second. Now, if you're in, based in Sydney, actually, right now there's a great display of Ramses the um, second in in Australia. It's actually a fantastic display. We went to it um, last week. So it's during that time, during his reign, that we have the Exodus. Um, the people of God are, are set free. Um, led out by Moses uh, and off into the promised land. Now, that to give that some historical perspective, that coincides about the same time as the Trojan War. So think about the story of Homer and how ancient that story is. That's the same time frame as what happened here with, with the Jewish people. So that's the traditional view. But then you've got, I guess, the more, I guess, the skeptical view of the story. You know, it's starting from the fact that there's no evidence for this from uh, any of our Egyptian sources, you've got more of a minimalist view that there was there was certainly um, a people group called Israel, but they were never actually in Egypt. They were actually always based in Canaan. And, and the arguments for this are that the, the, the Hebrew language um, emerges from what we know of the Canaanite languages of the era, um, that the the their idea of worship, the idea of Yahweh, that it has a lot more. It seems to have a lot more evidence within 
the region of Canaan. And so what they suspect is that probably there was a small tribe, a small group um, called Israel within that region who sort of grew and sort of came to establish themselves eventually as their own city-state, as they sort of grew and expanded and, and sort of consolidated themselves as a much larger people group within the region that we find them. And so this is what I mean when I say earlier that it's sort of a combination of, of history and myth. There's clearly mythological stories within Genesis. There's stories that are, um, they're, they're just, they're, they're clearly sort of grounded in, in mythological stories, typical of what we would find within an oral culture. Now, it's not my, I'm not here to criticize the Bible or to say that it's, it's untrue or anything like this, but simply to point out that it, there's always naturally going to be a mixture of these things. And, and look, it's, you know, the scholars are going to continue to to argue over this and to try to decipher out which is myth and which is the which is history which is grounded in fact it's not really the point of what we're doing here what's the key point that we're talking about here is that at the core of the jewish identity is the idea that their god that yahweh liberated them from slavery that's the essential point here now what again whatever the historical evidence for this story is, is actually beside the point. What is essential to understand is that in Jesus' time, for the Jewish people, and and still today for the Jewish people, is this idea that their foundation, their origin, is that their God, Yahweh, liberated them from slavery, that he set them free, that he brought them into their own land and established them as a nation. That was the key point, that the God that they worship established them as a nation. He set them apart as a people, that he gave them their own place to dwell and that they were unique. They were singularly called out of all of the peoples to be his representatives and that ultimately that they would bring about um, his plans for the world. They would be his representatives in the world. That's what's essential to the Jewish identity. And this is what is key. And we we have to understand the centrality of this part of the story if we're going to understand who Jesus is. And so then the story for the Jewish people is that Yahweh created a nation with them. He not just a figurative nation, but an actual nation. They were they had their own land, they were their own people, and they were they were held together by their um, by their biological descendancy. That they were ethnically the people of God. They were ethnically Jewish people because they can trace their their descendancy back to this one figure, this man Abraham, got the God who called Abraham, who gave him the sons and the sons and the sons of the sons. They then become his people, the people of Yahweh, who now have their own land, who now have their own place to settle down and to establish themselves as a nation like all of the other nations around them, all of these other city-states that we find within this Bronze Age civilization, the same way we find the Jewish people. And so that's a really key feature that we, we need to keep in mind. And that's what we're going to continue to unpack because as this story continues, it becomes a story of the challenges that that any nation faces and certainly the Jewish people faced is the challenges that come with being a nation, the, the, the challenges that come with having land, particularly as this story evolves, when we come across the increasing pressure that they have find as a nation from the many empires that rise and fall around them and just the the general pressures that are put on them from the cultures of the nations that are around them as well. So that's what we're going to sort of come into. But before we get there, we just want to sort of today for the rest of this particular episode anyway, just have a look at the Jewish faith and and look at what was so unique or, or what was so central to the beliefs of the Jewish people. What made them, what was at the core of their understanding about themselves? Well, the first thing that was unique about them was that they were monotheistic. They, they only worshipped one God. Now, there's things about the Jewish faith that they, they won't surprise us in any way. And we, almost, we have to remind ourselves of how unique these things are. We 
certainly in the West, we take for granted a Judeo-Christian heritage. We are the products of Judeo-Christianity, which takes for granted and has done for thousands of years that there is only one God. We, we don't really do polytheism anymore. That's certainly, certainly in the West. It's just not something that we have um, as a part of our culture anymore. So if you do believe in a God, you generally only believe in one God, and that's just sort of taken for granted. Go back to this time, and that idea of only having one God is just extraordinary. The whole function of Genesis 1 and the early chapters of Genesis is to establish a world, a universe, where there's only one God who does all of those things. You know, if you think about um, the all of the sort of origin myths from all of the indigenous cultures and, and sort of the ancient cultures, they have thousands upon thousands of gods who function in all of these different aspects of the universe every part of the aspect is every aspect of the universe is controlled by a particular god and even going back to the foundations there are multiple gods who are all at work within that origin within that foundation what genesis is doing is just providing a, a, a new narrative a new way of looking at the creation account and saying that all of it was done by god all of it was done by Yahweh. In fact, a, a key tenet of the story is that God created us to be in relationship as opposed to, say, the Babylonian gods who were cre created people to be their slaves. This was the competing origin myths that the Jewish people were, were working against. There were worldviews that said the gods created us literally to be their slaves, whereas this Yahweh, our God, created us to be in relationship. He didn't create us to work for him. He created us to be in partnership with him. And so what the whole Genesis account is presenting is a, a universe, is, is a, a whole existence that only requires the one God. And so that's very unique. And more than just having one God, a God who cares. Again, gods of the ancient world are localized. They're gods that you go into a particular place and there's a God in that region. And so when you go into an area, the first thing you have to find out is who are the gods in the region, right? Who are the gods that are in control of this particular place that we find ourselves? Who are they? What do they want from us? How do we um, live and interact with them in a way that doesn't cause them to kill us? That, that's the fundamental question that everybody needs to find out. Before you do anything else, how do we ex coexist with these gods that we're, now, uh, that, we're, that we're now dwelling with? But these gods don't care about us, right? These gods only care about us if we offend them, if we, if we step on their toes. But apart from that, we just need to stay out of their way. And if we do offend them, offer them the right sacrifices so that they don't kill us. That's how we relate to the gods. And this is true for all polytheistic cultures. More than that, they don't care how we behave in the sense of our morality. They, they care zero for anything to do with our morality. We can do whatever we want to each other. That's fine. We just don't offend them. That's all that matters. As opposed to this Yahweh, who, number one, is the God who creates and, and sustains everything. The entire universe is held together by this one single God. But this God reached out to us. This God reached out to us for relationship. He wanted to establish relationship with us. And more than that, he cares about how we act. He wants us to act in a way that doesn't offend him, of course, but he made that very clear. We don't have to, you know, we don't have to look for bird signs or see what the, the stars are doing to try to figure out what the gods want from us. He made it very clear for us. He gave us a set of laws and said, do these things, act towards me in these particular ways, act towards each other in these particular ways, and you'll do really well. That's, that's what I require from you. He made it very clear for us and he cared about us. He actually reached out to us to enter into a, a covenant relationship with us. Again, incredibly unique, incredibly unprecedented within anything of this time and within this region. And so then the second aspect of this Jewish faith, of, this, of their understanding, is the idea of election. Now, it, is, it flows out of the previous point, but God chose a people, a nation for himself. He set them apart as a nation for himself. He found us. 
right? He set us apart and then he gave us a land. He created a nation that was unique amongst the many nations and ideally a nation that would be attractive to others to come into, to who would want to become part of this, this nation that he's making for them. And so there's a sense of uniqueness about their identity. They are unique amongst the people. They're not just unique ethnically, but they're unique in the sense that the one true God has chosen them. Now, others can, of course, participate in this, can come and be part of this nation. Um, but again, you have to become part of this nation to, to do that. You are, But in doing that, you're becoming also part of this unique story of this God who is electing it and calling out for himself his own people. And so there's a sort of, there's a sense of, I guess, superiority, maybe even arrogance arrogance um, amongst the this the, the sort of the Jewish people in this in this sense in that they are elected and for good reason uh, God himself has selected them for this particular thing and so uh, amongst the nations of that time and of that region there is a sense of of superiority that the, the one God and as opposed to these false gods has chosen them to be his nation and so election is an essential part of their identity. They are unique. They are special in the fact that God called them out. And so then also connected to that is the idea of covenant, of faith and righteousness, uh, that God entered into an agreement with his people. He set a contract for his people and there were terms for this contract. And so this contract was this agreement as to how they should live, how they should interact with each other and how they should interact with the God that has elected them, the God that has called them to be his people. And so like any contract, the validity of the contract is maintained by faithfulness. I mean, we talk about faith uh, in sort of the Christian sense. We talk about belief in God, a God that we can't see, and yet we have faith that God is real. That's true, but there's a much deeper sense to what this faith means. What it means is faithfulness. It's not just about do you believe in God, it's do you trust God? Do you actually um, do you maintain that relationship with him? Even in times where it seems confusing or you're not sure what's going on, are you still faithful towards that God? Uh, are you, or are you looking for other options? Are you only um, looking to this God for relationship when it's convenient or, or when things are going well? Or are you faithful to God? Are you committed to him and exclusively to him, to him and him alone? Now, as we see, for, as, as, we, as the story goes on, what we find out is that this was a real challenge for, the, for, for Israel. This was a real challenge for the Jewish people is to remain faithful. And what we find happening so often is that they go off to the other gods. They, they, they're challenged to go and worship or they, they're challenged by the, the, the appeal of these other gods who have these very cool temples and statues and sacrifices and all of these things, cultural pressure that they find, and they challenge, it challenges their faithfulness. They, they don't see Yahweh as maybe being good enough for, for what their needs are, and so they go looking for help or they look for whatever it is with these other gods. And so, you know, God always sort of talks about this as being an unfaithful spouse, right? You're, you're going into the bed of another of another lover. Well, that's what you're doing when you break this covenant, this faithful relationship that we have. When you go and worship these other gods, it, it's no different to infidelity in a marriage. And so the requirement then for God's people is to maintain, to remain faithful to him, to, to trust in his promise and to live according to his holy requirements. Again, he set out what it is, what is required. He wants his people to be righteous. He wants his people to be a reflection of him, you know, be holy as I am holy. Um, you know, God wants so much more from his people than what these other gods do. Again, these gods don't care about your morality. They don't care about um, whether or not you're faithful to them. You, the, the, thing, the thing about worshiping one of these other gods in, in the land of Canaan is that you can worship that God and every other God, in fact, you're expected to, right? You, you have to worship all of these other gods. There is no exclusiveness. There is no unique relationship. And they certainly don't care about how you behave with each other in between again whereas with this god the god who fills the universe the god who is the one and only true god does require that faithfulness and certainly requires us much more of us in being righteous in, in being much more like him to be a reflection of him to the world and so then in order to to make this clear or to to really make it um, black and white obvious to his people how he wants them to interact, he gave them 
laws. Uh, he gave them Torah. He gave them teaching, instruction in, in how to do this. Now, again, this is something incredibly unique um, in comparison to all of the other religions that we find and all of the other gods that we find throughout this time is that this god actually wrote down what he wanted from his people. All right, gods don't write things down. The idea of the gods is that they change their minds all the time. These gods are fickle in, in so many ways, and the only way you can know what the god wants is to go and ask the priest who's going to go and look at what the birds are doing or what the weather's doing and to try to get some indication of what the gods want. But that could, be, that could change from day to day. This god actually says, I'm going to write it down for you. I'm going to make it as clear as I possibly can. Here's 10 simple rules that I want you to do, and that's it, and I'm not going to change my mind, right? I am who I am. I do not change. And so my rules don't change. My requirements don't change. And if they ever do change, I'll let you know. But until then, trust me, whatever I've said here is how it's going to be and how it's going to remain from here until whenever. And so he set out these laws. He set out these requirements for his people into how that they should act as a way to, to live with each other, but also to live in a way that pleases him. Now, here's a very important sidetrack that we need to sort of grasp is we're talking, of course, about the Old Testament here. What is the Old Testament? Well, the Old Testament, first and foremost, we'll talk about the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. What they are, first and foremost, is a constitution. Right? If you think about the constitution of a nation, the na any nation needs the constitution, a set of laws and a set of requirements for citizenship. If you're going to be a citizen of this, na of this nation, this is what it requires. Um, these are our laws. These, these are what we value. And so these are the things that you you need to live by. Well, that's exactly what the Pentateuch is. It's the constitution of a nation. You are my people. I'm calling you to be a nation. You are um, a people set apart in this particular piece of land. You are going to be my people. And so to be a nation, this is how a nation needs to live. These are the laws by which you live. And so what the Pentateuch becomes is a constitution. Right, these aren't laws for Christians. These aren't laws that we're meant to live by. They don't, they're not written for us. They're not relevant to us. Right? Christianity is a whole different thing. These are the laws for a 3,000-year-old people group who are living in a particular place in the world, on a particular geographical part of the world, at a particular time and location. This is how they are supposed to live as a nation, as an, as an ethnic nation, as a geographical nation, uh, in the context of that particular time and place. And so it's first and foremost a constitution by which they need to live and to be the people of God. And so then what that Pentateuch is, it's, it's laws, it's the laws of a nation, but it's much more than just, oh, these are the things that, got, that make God angry or if you break any of these things, you need to offer a sacrifice. No, it's, it's an entire way of life. Torah is a way of life. It's, it, it covers every aspect. Like, why is it so concerned about food and clothing and all of these things? Well, in, for a nation to be God's people, you need to cover all of your bases. And so what this becomes is an entire way of living as not just to, again, please God, but to form a society, right? To, to interact with each other in such a way that as a relational group, as a people group, um, you, you live together in harmony. You, you live together in a way that in the way that you relate to each other, you reflect Yahweh's righteous requirements. You live in a way that pleases God in the way that you present God to those outside, the way that you interact with the nations around you, with the other people groups. All of that is part of your everyday life. And so all of that has requirements. All of that needs to be um, sort of led or at least to be instructed in some way so that in every aspect of your life you are again living in a way that pleases Yahweh and so it's an entire way of life that you're to live by and that's all of that is encapsulated in this Torah. There's then another key aspect then of the Jewish faith and this is probably the one that was the least unique of of its kind and this is very um, common through all ancient religion is the idea of purity Purity is a common idea in all ancient cultures and in, in, in all ancient sort of religions and cults. And it's the idea of being ritually pure when you approach the God. It's been, um, pure, it's been clean before the God. Now, 
to understand purity, um, when you think about all the purity laws, there's dietary laws that we find in, uh, in, in the Old Testament, and a lot of those are just good hygiene, right? I mean, it's just the idea of burning old meat. Well, you don't eat old meat because you're going to get sick and die, right? It's the, when you have bodily discharges or if you have leprosy, get out of the community because those things are going to infect everybody else. I mean, these are just good common sense laws that in a time before medicine were quite unique, right? You sort of, you know, there was, I guess, some understanding of that person when their skin's falling off them, that seems to be contagious, maybe get rid of that person. But these more specific ideas and teachings that we find in Torah are really quite unique. And when you look at them, very good ideas, good ways to live as a society so that we don't kill each other through simple diseases or that we don't eat food that is going to kill us and, and make us very sick. So that's what we've, those sort of things are going to be, uh, uh, what well, you would expect. These are, these are just good ways to live as a society so we don't kill each other. But the, the general idea of purity is, is really the idea of dirt. Now, this is an idea formulated by an anthropologist named Mary Douglas. Now, what, the way that she's trying to sort of understand how these ancients sort of thought about the idea of purity is the idea of dirt. Now, if you think about dirt, right, dirt is, well, it's, it's dirt. And dirt in a garden is a wonderful thing. Rich brown dirt is, is an excellent thing because it produces life. Dirt in its right place is, is great. It's a wonderful thing and it's the source of life. But if you take a handful of that dirt and you throw it across your carpet, now it's dirt, now it's, it's out of place, it's disgusting, it doesn't belong there. It's, it's a stain, right? Um, I, I, I like the example, it's like when you go to the beach, for, for instance, right? You go to the beach, you walk along the sand and you build sand castles and the kids love playing in the sand and all of that's wonderful. On the beach, it's, it's a wonderful thing and it feels good and you're walking along the sand and, and all of this. It's, sand is, is great at the beach. But then... When you carry that sand home and when it ends up in your bed and you're trying to sleep and you've got sand falling off you, I remember we went, uh, we were down the beach a few years ago and um, the baby, uh, she just wanted to sleep in the bed. And so she was in the bed every night and she'd been at the beach all day. And so we just kept finding sand all through the bed and it was just, it was infuriating. It's like, but take this sand a couple hundred meters down to the beach and it's a wonderful thing. And so that's the idea of dirt, of, of purity. It's something that's out of place. It's something that doesn't belong in a particular place. And so we find purity laws in all of these ancient civilizations, and especially when it comes to the temple, uh, when it comes to the worship and the sacrifice. If you're going to approach a god, you have to be ceremonially clean. You have to be ritually clean. And so particularly things like um, you know any sort of bodily discharges, women that are menstruating, uh, these things are an impurity and so they need to be cleansed. Now, they're natural parts of what we, what we do as humans but they don't belong in this particular place uh, or in this particular time. And so to be sort of be cleansed, you have to be washed in order for you to be clean to be able to enter into, uh, into the place of sacrifice. So cleansing and purity was a central feature and probably the most ununique um, element of the Jewish faith. But then at the same way, so was sacrifice. Sacrifice is a common, a very standard feature of all ancient religions. And so the sacrifice of an animal on behalf of a person's wrongdoing very standard part of all ancient religions. And so the Jewish people were no different. They had sacrifices as a means of atoning for whatever sins they might have committed. Now, sin, to properly understood, is a bit like impurity. Uh, we think about purity, if you have a, a bodily discharge, that's something that is natural, you can't help that, but you you can be uh, become a pollutant to others around you. You can become, you can infect other people in the community around you, and so you need to be removed from the community in order for that to happen. Sin is is similar in that it's an impurity, but it's a, a voluntary impurity. You know what the laws are, you know what the rules are, but you've voluntarily broken them. You've broken them. Now, you're not going to infect other people with your sin. You, If you're carrying sin, that doesn't infect other people and make them sinners by virtue of, of touching you in the same way that like maybe leprosy would, but you still need to be atoned for that. You still need to remove that impurity. And the only way that's going to happen is that you need to impart that 
sin, that, that impurity into another animal and then sacrifice that animal. So this happens once a year on the Day of Atonement. The, the, the sins of the nation are imparted into a sacrificial animal, a scapegoat, and then which is then sacrificed on behalf of the people. And so it's it's another way of it's it, it is an impurity, but it's a way of being cleansed from that impurity that we call sin. And so then the final thing, again, it's it's very ununique in the context of the time, but the idea of a priesthood. And so a priesthood is established for um, for the people. This is the, the the idea of the nation of Israel, and this is an idea we're going to pick up in a lot more detail next week is that Israel is going to be a theocracy. There are kings. All of these great city-states have monarchs. They have kings. That's a very familiar part of the ancient world and ancient cities, and that's really true up until really uh, up until sort of the, the 19th century. Monarchies are a standard part of, of how the world is organized. And so that's no different, and Israel is going to have a monarch, only their monarch is going to be God. God is going to be the king of this of this place and they're going to have a priesthood who are going to be the ones who um, mediate between the king but also between the god and the people and so that also gets established as a part of this new nation but again we're going to pick that up next we can spend a lot more time talking about how that whole sort of governmental structure works but the point from this week's episode is just to reiterate the idea that Israel was uh, a chosen nation, and that's how they always understood themselves. God chose them. They God called them out beginning with Abraham and that all of his descendants, and going right down to Jesus, who was a descendant of Abraham through Judah, these these are, I, we are they are a unique people. We are a unique people, and this is what sets us apart. This is what makes us different from all of the nations around us. And so it's that unique identity that we need to sort of zero in on. And that's what's going to can we develop that now over the next several weeks, uh, however long this series takes, um, and, and how that sort of sort of falls flows into the person of Jesus. How, how does that sort of culminate itself on the cross where we find Jesus as being accused of or claiming to be the king of this unique people group, this these these Jewish people. Well, anyway, thank you so much for joining this week. Again, welcome back to 2024. I hope this is a fantastic year for you. And join me next week. We will continue on our story of the people of God and, and how this nation was first formed. And so have a great week and I'll see you then. Mm-hmm.